Our next speaker is Professor Paul, Paul Bachtel. <coughs> I will also talk a bit about my views of the Israeli economy. I enjoyed uh, Mr. Halpern's uh, history, uh, but as you'll see, I think the, the present is very different. Uh, the invitation to participate in this wonderful conference arrived while I was visiting the Central Bank of Finland in Helsinki a few months ago. Uh, it struck me then that uh, Israel and Finland have some similarities. For sure not the climate, uh, but in other respects. Uh, both are small countries. Uh, Finland has barely more than 5 billion people, less than Israel. Open economies uh, that rely on trade. Countries with distinctive cultures, a virtually unique language, and a highly educated population that has in each case since the 1950s, taken a poor agricultural economy, lumber in, is in Finland, oranges in Israel, into the high-tech world and near wealthy country status. If you take a longer term view, there are even some political commonalities. Finland has not always been on friendly terms with its neighbors. For hundreds of years, the Swedes denied Finnish sovereignty, and then the Russians did until the end of World War I. But what puzzles me about all this is that everyone thinks of Finland as a very normal place, and Israel as an unusual, special case among the nations of the world. Well, when it comes to economics, at least in the modern times, this might not be true. Israel might finally be fulfilling the Zionist dream. What I have in mind here is the comment attributed and one of my co colleagues here at Barlon checked this out, attributed with primarily not a shred of evidence to Chaim Nachman Bialik concerning normality of countries. Bialik is supposed to have said that the existence of Israeli thieves and prostitutes would prove the place normal. I understand that that case has been amply proven. My contention today is going to be that Israel also might be quite normal in other respects as well, at least as when it comes to the economy. And here's a rare instance where an economist can stand up and bring some good news to the table. I also want to compare uh, the, the, the situation in Israel to the situation in the United States. How about the United States? It's, uh, in economic terms, the United States has always been an exceptional, unnormal country. It's the biggest, the most powerful, the richest uh, country in the world for over 100 years. It has dominated the world economy, and American technology and culture dominate the, the world as well. The United States surely is not just another normal country, or is it? My theme today is that the United States and Israel might not be so special after all. Israel's economic successes in the last 20 years or so have made it very much a normal place. And America's economic crisis in the last five or 10 years or so has made it more and more like every other country around the world too. Now to begin, let's look at some of the things that, that have made Israel in the past such an unusual or special country. One of them, the first one I had on my list, was already discussed earlier this morning, was the relationship between oil dependency and economic security. Israel's economic and political security were always intertwined because of its reliance on oil imports. As long as the OPEC cartel could effectively control the supply and price of oil internationally, Israel was under threat. But that's no longer the case. The cartel is gone. Sure enough, lots and lots of oil production still takes place in the Persian Gulf. But the economic fact is that OPEC neither controls the price of oil or which countries it flows to. There is a world supply and demand and the global market. Oil security is not the issue that it was years ago. And in fact, Israel might emerge in the next generation with its own industry as an energy exporter. The other thing that made Israel so special was the burden of its military defense. The fraction of GDP devoted to defense expenditures 
around 8% now in Israel, is still pretty high by international standards. But the burden has diminished as the economy has grown. U.S. defense expenditures uh, during the Vietnam War were 8% of GDP. Uh, they were 6% of GDP during the Reagan defense buildup. They're about 5% of GDP at the present time. Surely defense is a burden for Israel, but it is an exaggeration to characterize the country as being always on a full wartime footing. Such things happen. Countries spend 10, 20% or more of GDP on their defense expenditures. But Israel now is successful enough where that is not the case, and not the case in the foreseeable future. The country is just about rich enough to afford its own defense. GDP per capita in Israel has been catching up with the United States, from 42% of the US level 50 years ago to about 60% of the US level and a much higher US level today. Israel, Israel is firmly entrenched as one of the world's developed near wealthy economies. GDP per capita in Israel is almost as large as it is in Korea the growth miracle of the last latter part of the 20th century. It's only about 15% less than it is in Spain or Italy. It's about 75% more than GDP per capita in Argentina, which was once one of the world's richest countries, and 75% more than it is in Turkey. And of course, it is four times larger than GDP per capita in any of the countries on its borders with the exception of Lebanon. In addition, current indicators of economic well-being are all very promising. The current account is in surplus. Foreign exchange reserves are large. The government deficit is relatively small by international standards. And the government to GDP ratio has declined substantially. This all contrasts very dramatically with the situation in the United States where the current account is in large deficit, foreign debts are large, the government deficit is stubbornly large, and the government debt to GDP ratio is exploding. So we look at the contemporary Israeli economy, there's good reason to be pleased. Israel has a normal, healthy economy. But like all normal places, there are problems. What are they? They are not security threats from abroad, at least not in economic terms, uh, or the global economic crisis, or the consequences of foreigners bidding up the price of prime real estate. Instead, the answers lie right here. I'm reminded of the famous aphorism that comes from the American comic strip, Pogo. We have met the enemy, and he is us. There are two facets of the Israeli economy internally that deserve more attention because they can inhibit the future growth and well-being of Israeli society. The first is the nexus of poverty and education, and the second is the lack of competition in key sectors of industry and punishing bureaucratic structures. Now, Stanley Fisher has spoken about these on many occasions, but he does so with the measured tones of a central banker. It seems to me that the Israeli public does not appreciate how important these things are. Despite the growth which has narrowed the per capita GDP gap between Israel and other rich countries, income inequality in Israel has widened and the incidence of poverty has increased since the 1980s. By both measures, Israel's statistics are much worse than the average for other OECD countries. Now, poverty is related to the social structure. Haredim and Arabs are an increasing fraction of the population of Israel. Labor force participation is low in both these groups. Haredi men and Arab women don't like to go to work. School attainment in these groups is far below that for the rest of the population, and wages are low. Further, the incidence of poverty within these groups is increasing. But for whatever the reason, 
whether it's social, cultural, political, Israel is developing a dual labor market in a severely segmented society. A growing proportion of Israelis are not part of the modern, dynamic, growing economy, and this can severely inhibit growth in the future. The second concern is the issue of competition and bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. The World Bank compiles indexes that it calls doing business in different countries. They are based on real nitty-gritty issues. How long does it take uh, and how expensive is it to register a company? How long does it take to get a building permit for a building, for, for a business facility? Uh, how long does it take to get credit and start exporting? How long and how expensive is it for an entrepreneur to put things together to start some kind of entrepreneurial activity? Now, Israel does not do badly on these indexes except when it comes to registering property and obtaining building permits. However, in the 10 years that these indexes have been compiled, Israel, even with its business-oriented prime minister, has not risen in the country's standings. Further, the Israeli public sector still has a very heavy hand in regulating the economy. I am most familiar with the universities. They are excellent. But rigid work rules and salary structures in Israel's public universities, salary structures that are unrelated to performance, are hurting the quality of these institutions. Now, this is true in other countries, but lots of other formerly socialist countries, places like Italy, places like Germany, are introducing competitive evaluation and reward structures in public higher education more quickly than Israel is doing so. The lack of competition in Israeli industry has two aspects. First, much of the economy is dominated by a handful of family conglomerates that have links to a wide variety of businesses, including financial institutions. The government for a couple of years has argued that steps will be taken to change this. Well, I, I guess we'll see. Uh, maybe I don't, you know, I don't read the Hebrew press. Maybe there are steps that I haven't seen, but I think more needs to be done. Uh, second, and harder to address, is the fact that Israel is a small country with very little trade with its immediate neighbors. So much local production from mundane things like toothpaste are restricted to very, very small markets. In many industries, there are just a few firms, or one, that are not eager to compete with each other. As a result, internet service here is more expensive than it is in the United States. Banking service charges can be outrageous, and retail prices are often higher than they are abroad. Why does a kosher wine in Renata cost more than it does in Riverdale? Now, there are other countries with these kinds of problems. Small markets with economic activity dominated by a handful of politically connected local oligopolies, and a political structure that protects business incumbents by presenting impediments to opening new business and regulations that insulate distribution chains from foreign competition. Now, the best example that comes to mind of a small country with those problems is one you would not want to emulate. That's Greece. So Israel is a normal place. It has elements of great success like Finland, and it has problems to contend with like Greece. How about the United States? How normal is it? Will it dominate the 21st century in the same way that it dominated the 20th? Or is the American golden age over? Just as the United States pushed the United Kingdom off of center stage uh, 100 or more years ago, will China push the United States into also run states? Difficult question to answer. Won't be an answered in the American presidential campaign uh, that we discussed this morning. The presidential campaign emphasizes the current business cycle, which can really drive the election results. Just a few weeks ago, the monthly jobs report came in below expectations. 
Only 69,000 new jobs were created in May in the United States, where an economy growing at long-term trend needs to generate about 200,000 jobs each month. President Obama will note that 69,000 will keep us out of recession. And Mr. Romney will note that 69,000 is clearly not enough. The Federal Reserve, our major economic policy-making body, uh, is meeting tomorrow. And its Federal Open Market Committee will determine whether any further action in regard to monetary policy is either desirable or possible given the constraints that it faces. The fact is that the recovery in the United States is terribly anemic. We are now 36 months beyond the end of the recession associated with the financial crisis, the, which was the longest recession in the post-World War II period. And the economy is still far from making up the ground lost in that recession period. This is not surprising to, to most economists because recessions, recessions associated with financial crises are the hardest to overcome. And it's in this instance, the US relies on demand and business confidence around the world. And all of the large markets, Europe, China, Brazil, India, are weakening. And the crisis of confidence in the world economy creates a downward spiral which is hard to reverse. The long run prospects for the United States depend upon our ability to cope with some structural issues which will hardly get discussed in the presidential campaign. They are serious, they are similar to problems faced by other countries, and they suggest to me that the United States is just a big normal country with problems. What are they? One, like Israel and many countries around the world, we are facing a widening income distribution. The proportion of total income going to those in the top few percentiles has been increasing for a generation already. In the United States, as well as in other developed countries, even ones which have a much more equitable distribution of income, like Sweden. There are some good economic reasons for this. On the demand side, improvements in technology make the demand for unskilled labor less than it was in the past. On the supply side, with respect to the United States, lots of immigration of unskilled workers makes them abundantly available. And it's not surprising in economic terms that wages are very low. Now, some might argue that this is all supply and demand in equilibrium, as economists like to call things. And what are the, whatever the outcome, whatever the market outcome happens to be, it's the right thing. Further, the Republicans are fond of pointing out that taxing the well-off reduces their incentives to succeed. So taxes on business income, dividends, capital gains, the forms of income that propel the top 1% ahead are viewed with disdain. Such taxation, it is argued, chokes off the entrepreneurial drive of the economy. And the Democrats have done very little to counter these arguments. A more equitable income distribution is an important social value. And there are levels of taxation of the wealthy and of capital gains that do not choke off the animal spirits of capitalists. But the United States, with ideological lines drawn, really needs to stop, step back and ask itself what kind of society it wants to have. Extraordinary inequality drives social unrest, reduces trust in society, and makes people feel alienated. That should not be our American goal. The Arab Spring illustrated this. I know somebody this morning suggested it was caused by Obama, but it started with economics. The tax cuts enacted by George W. Bush in 2001 and 2003 are due to expire at the end of this year. The pressure to renew them, or renew them for all but the very rich, will be much debated. But the discussion obscures the, la the real problem. The last time that the American tax structure was simplified, broadened, and made more fair, with loopholes eliminated, was 1986. Our truck tax structure is full of unfair things that favor special interests. 
The U.S. deserves and can afford to be a more equitable society if there is the political will. In the 1980s and 90s, po politicians were able to put aside rhetoric and arrive at solutions that struck a balance between competing ideologies. In the last 10 years, this has not been the case. Either the politics of polarization have paralyzed the country, or Reagan and Clinton were more effective leaders than Bush and Obama. The tax equality issue is complicated by the fact that the United States is running a large fiscal deficit. Um, not only is it large now, but because, because of the sluggish recovery, uh, but with the American population aging, it will get larger in the future. Our aging population does not create as serious a problem as aging populations do in other countries around the world, including China, as a consequence of the one-child policy, most of Western Europe, and Japan, where the population is already declining rather rapidly. But our aging population means that the proportion of GDP that has to be devoted under current legislative and other arrangements to public pensions, social security, and health care provision has to increase by about six percentage points over the course of the next 20 years. We don't worry about that right now because it's not a problem. Interest rates, the United States can finance its deficit virtually for nothing. Interest rates on long-term U.S. government bonds are as low as they've ever been in history. Everybody knows that the U.S. is rock solid and runs to buy U.S. government bonds. But we forget that market confidence is fickle. Until 2008, Spain and Italy also had relatively low bond rates. Everything was fine, rock solid, until it wasn't. I will conclude. Uh, a century of American specialness does not justify complacency. Politics has pushed these structural concerns into the background, and that is a mistake for the American people. The U.S. is a normal place with problems, and it should face them. But the last point I want to turn to is, you know, give me a minute, sure. is what has made the United States so special for the course of these last hundred years, and has that disappeared altogether? Um, economists like to think in terms of a product, what we call a production function. You take capital, you take labor, and you produce output. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's how you put things together. And what I think differentiates the United States is its nimbleness. The ability to respond to change, rearrange the way we do things, invent new industries, move resources around quickly, update educational systems, take advantage of new ideas, get rid of things that do, that do not work. That's what I call the American mojo. That's an English word, I don't know what the Hebrew is for it. It's the magic charm, the supernatural power that has made the American economy different for the last hundred years. Americans change jobs, change location, change profession, change activity, try new things, get rid of old things more frequently and more easily than any other people of any other country. That I don't think has disappeared. And in that sense, the United States stays special in the 21st century. Challenge for Israel is to, to, is to extend that same mojo to this country. It exists in certain places. It exists in the technological industries that have emerged from the military, which have propelled the Israeli economy forward. The challenge for Israel is to take that nimbleness, that American nimbleness, and apply it throughout the American economy, and the, throughout the Israeli economy. And the challenge for America is to make sure that its political problems, which have made it so difficult to deal with some of the structural issues, doesn't eradicate that American mojo or nimbleness that has served the United States so well in the last hundred years. If both countries can do this, they will both be special in the 21st century as well. Thank you.